Okie dokie, in that case, let us get started on lecture 17 on glacier dynamics. And we started a little bit of this on Friday, which now seems a very long time ago, doesn't it? Um, but we really started talking about the fact that a glacier is a glacier because it moves. It's part of the definition of it being a glacier is that it's this solid block of ice that moves. So we're going to cover today some of the sort of finer detail about that. So we're going to look at some of the patterns of which bits move when and where. We're going to look at how fast they can go. Um, we're going to also look at sort of what controls how fast they grow. Uh, they grow, they flow. And in particular, we're going to look at basal sliding. We're going to ignore the internal deformation aspect of it and just think more about that sliding process. So before we get going, it is that time again. I know. I'm afraid that midterm two is on Monday. Okay? And so it's going to be exactly the same format as it was before. So uh, it's uh, at the normal time in this room, it's about half multiple choice, half short answer questions. It'll cover lecture 9 to 18, so it isn't cumulative, but it will cover this week. But there are certain things that in order to understand what we've done this part of the quarter, you'll need to understand from the first part. And those are all listed in the study guide. Things like the climate is warming up, things like albedo. Those are concepts that we introduced in the first part of the quarter, but we've been using again and again. So those are things that you would still be expected to understand and use. There will be assigned seating. I still have the list of left-handed people from, I'll come back to you in a sec, left-handed people um, from earlier this quarter. But if you are left-handed and didn't email me last time, if you could do that, um, I can make sure that we don't sit too many right-handed people in uh, left-handed seats. So a uh, question at the back and then you're at the, the. Oh, I'm so sorry. I took this from last year. Very good question. It is not 1 to 150. In fact, I will change that now. It is 2 to 2.50. So normal time in here. Sorry about that, guys. OK. 2 to 2.50, normal time. Thank you. Is that the same question that you had? OK. Thank you for catching me out. So as, as before, you'll need a Scantron, that 288. Um, and so please do remember to bring it. Because this class is just too big. We don't have enough that we can just hand them out, um, because we have to pay for them too. So please do bring them. Um, and remember your student ID. Um, the study guide is available on the website. It has been since last weekend. And I know a lot of you have found it. Um, I'll update it after the last two lectures this week to um, change anything that we might or might not have covered. Um, and that will be done on Friday. Um, I'll be also in my office from 9 till 10.30 on Monday. If you have any last minute panicked questions, um, please do come see me and I'd be happy to talk over anything. Does anyone have questions about the midterm? So just like last time, focus on understanding um, rather than memorizing. OK, so there is, is going to be a midterm review. Um, it will be in here from 3 to 4, so immediately after class on Friday. So hopefully most people will be able to stick around. Um, and again, we're not going to be telling you what is on the exam, because I probably won't have written it by then. Um, instead, uh, if you would like to take that opportunity to go through any quiz questions or ask to go through any concepts, then uh, whoever leads that would be very happy to do that. OK. So that's all of that nonsense. So let's now think about more interesting things. Let's think again about how our glacier works and how it flows. And I know that this was quite a long time ago, so I did want to re quickly review that glacier or glacier ice deforms as a viscoplastic material. And it's plastic because we have to exert a certain amount of force on it before it will start to move. And if we exert too much force, then it will break and snap. Okay. But it's viscous. The viscous part of it is because once it is moving, once we've exerted enough force, it will behave like a fluid. And so it will flow. And we've seen those beautiful time lapse uh, videos of ice flowing. So some of you have already seen that documentary, and that shows it really nicely. But also those other little clips uh, we looked at last week of that ice sort of coming down the front of a mountain. And we have two types of glacier motion. We have basal sliding, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's movement of the whole glacier, just sort of sliding along. And then internal deformation, 
which is where the individual ice crystals slide past each other. And so here's a sort of a diagram showing that. So just as a reminder, that basal sliding where we have a thin layer of water underneath and that ice slides, just like when you uh, head down a slip and slide, it won't work if it's dry, you'll really hurt yourself. But when there's water on it, you can slide along quite nicely and glaciers work exactly the same way. And then the internal deformation is, do you remember I said that if you had a stack of playing cards or a stack of note cards and you pushed on it slightly, then the top would end up a lot further forward because it's sort of feeling the motion of all the ones underneath. And we'll have a chance to draw that in a little while. OK. And so we get those two different types of motion in our two different types of glacier. OK. So which one of these, our temperate glacier, which remember is close to zero degrees Celsius all the way through, or our polar glacier, so this was the quiz question no one liked. Our polar glacier, all you have to do is look through your notes, um, which is below zero degrees Celsius all the way down to the bottom. Which of these will only move by internal deformation? The polar, why? It's cold, and what's specific about it being cold means that it won't... There's no water, absolutely. So remember... Here we can see that our glacier is sort of relatively close to that melting point, and so at the base here we can get meltwater. If our glacier is sort of minus 10 degrees Celsius at the base, even if it sort of be, is put under a certain amount of pressure, it's really difficult to generate amounts of, of meltwater down there. Okay? And so our polar glaciers tend to be much slower because they really can only move by that internal deformation. They can't slide along nicely. In our temperate glaciers, that's where we get sort of faster moving, and they tend to be sort of that basal sliding is a lot of their motion, but they also do deform internally. So we're going to take an opportunity to draw that in a second. Because this is a horrible looking diagram, okay? Some of those diagrams I put up and people go, oh no, I can't, can't cope with this. So instead, let's draw this out piece by piece, and it will start to make a whole bunch more sense. Okay. So pens and paper out. So my drawing isn't going to be as artistically beautiful as the, uh, that diagram. But what we are going to think about is if I take a sort of a block of ice, it's going to have sort of three dimensions. So here's the base of my ice. And it's probably at a slight slope down that way. So here's rock, here's my ice, and here's sort of the edge where it sort of meets the, the mountain, OK? Mountain. <laughs> so if we want to think about uh, sort of measuring how our glacier moves, then the easiest way to think about it is if we just drilled a hole down to the bottom, and we put a pipe down there, okay, a solid pipe. And what we'll do is, after a certain length of time, we'll come back, and we'll see if that pipe has moved and see what shape that pipe is. Okay? So at my sort of time zero, I sort of drill a big hole in my ice sheet, and I put a sort of a pipe right down, down to the base. Okay? Does that make sense so far? So this is sort of depth in the ice sheet, and this is our base. If the glacier was only moving by basal sliding, what would happen if I came back in six months or so? What shape would that pipe be? The same, right? If all it's doing is sliding along, then it's just going to be the same. So if this glacier was only moving by basal sliding, if I came back in, say, six months' time and my pipe was here, then I would be able to say that this distance here was what was moved by basal sliding. Does that make sense? So we're ignoring any sort of internal deformation. All we're saying is that we're taking a solid block of ice and we're sliding it along. So that pipe running sort of up down through that ice isn't actually being deformed in any way. It's just staying straight. OK? And that distance that it moves is the amount of basal sliding it will have experienced. But we know that that isn't always the case, that we know that 
yes, we have a certain amount of basal sliding, but we also have a certain amount of internal deformation as well. And now we need to do a little bit more thinking. Because do you remember we did the maths, the horrible maths, um, that showed you what the driving stress would be? And do you remember some of the things it depended on? Density, Density definitely. Angle. The angle. The height. I think I heard gravity over there as well. Absolutely. So everyone's sort of thinking back. It was that height times the density times gravity and then the sine of the angle. Okay. And so what we can do is we can think, well, well before when we did that calculation, we just calculated that stress for the very base, didn't we? Because we used the whole height of that ice. Now if we think a little bit more specifically, what will happen to that driving stress as we go from, say, ice that's here, how much driving stress will that ice experience compared to down here? Will the ice down here experience more or less driving stress? More. Why? Yeah, absolutely, because there's more height. So there's more pressure on top, there's more weight, and so it experiences more of a driving stress. Whereas if we think about that ice at the top, there's really hardly any ice up at the top there. There's really hardly any ice, so there's really very little pressure, there's very little mass forcing it downwards, okay? And so it's not going to feel as much driving stress to move. And that's actually a really important distinction when we talk about internal deformation. Because do you remember that for our glacier to move by internal deformation, we have to overcome the internal strength of that ice. Where is it more likely we're going to be able to do that? Near the surface or near the base? So remember that the internal strength of the ice is sort of pushing back against the driving stress. So where is our driving stress more? Near the surface or near the base? Near the base. And so where is it more likely to be able to be stronger than that internal strength? At the bottom. At the bottom as well, right? So if our driving stress is more at the bottom, okay, it's going to be more likely to be able to overcome that internal strength. Does that make sense? I feel like people are feeling lost. Yes? No? No? Makes no sense? Great. Okay, one brave soul. So... Let me see if I can draw this. So if we're saying that the force that the ice here, here will feel is less because there's less overlying weight, then it's only going to feel a little driving stress. It's only going to be able to feel a little bit of, of sort of stress in that direction. Down here at the base, we've got all of that mass piled above. And so all of that sort of mass sort of weighing down means that we have a, a lot, lots and lots and lots of driving stress down at the base. But the internal strength of the ice is going to be pretty much consistent operating sort of, it's like that friction at the base, base it's sort of pushing back against that driving stress. It's resisting movement. And so up here at the top, you can see that that internal strength is pretty close to my driving stress, and so that ice wouldn't necessarily move. Whereas at the bottom, my driving stress is much better or much better, much bigger than that internal strength. And so that ice will actually flow. Does that make more sense now? Yes? Some nods. OK. And so this is actually very important for when we think about what internal deformation will do. Because therefore, where will our internal deformation mainly be? Will it be near at the top or near the bottom? bottom. It's going to be near the bottom. Okay, that's where our ice is going to be able to deform. That's where it's going to be able to flow. Once we get above a certain level, once we get a, sort of above a certain sort of depth in our ice, then there just isn't enough mass pushing down to generate the driving stress. Okay, and so ice above uh, sort of that certain depth won't flow. It will just sort of sit there and move as a solid block. Okay, and we can actually define that. So if we have a sort of a dotted line, so this is just some theoretical depth in my ice, okay? And above that, we have a zone of what we call rigid flow, okay? And down here, we have a zone of plastic 
flow. So what we say is that above that sort of theoretical depth in my ice, there isn't enough driving stress to overcome the strength of the ice, and so it just sort of moves as one solid block. Below that depth, we have enough driving stress that it will actually overcome the strength of the ice and it will flow. Okay? Does that make sense? A little bit. Okay. So, if we think about what our pipe would do as a result of this internal deformation, then really we're going to see a big change down here where our arrow is bigger. Okay? And then we're going to see sort of incremental change above that. But do you remember, just like I said with my playing cards, if I have a stack of playing cards like that, and I apply stress to them, then they actually move like this. So even if that top one, so in the case of my ice at the top, even if that isn't flowing, it's still going to be carried along by the movement of the ice underneath. Okay? So say this was a whole stack of cards at the top. If you slide the bottom, that stack at the top is still going to move along. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. And so if we look at what would happen, we'd see the greatest movement due to deformation down here. And then as we move up towards that line, we see a little bit less sliding each time because that weight over the top is less. And then at a certain point where we hit that line, then our cards aren't, our sort of ice isn't sliding past each other anymore. It's just sliding as one block. So down here, our sort of our ice is behaving like these playing cards where you can sort of slide them past each other. Okay? And the most movement will happen in that bottom card because that's where most of that driving stress is. But even if the layer above is feeling slightly less driving stress, it's still moving a certain distance because that underlying amount of ice is. And so that, that sort of motion is cumulative. You have to add the motion of the bottom card to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. Okay? So even if this top layer isn't internally def deforming, it has moved a certain distance because of what has happened underneath it. I feel like I've lost a lot of people. Is that true? Yes? OK. Let me think about a different way of drawing this. So let's just imagine our simple wooden blocks. OK? So I have a stack of wooden blocks. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to apply force only sort of here downwards. Okay. So these top ones are locked together, just like my rigid flow is at the top. They're locked together. Okay. If I apply a force in this direction down here, then I'm going to get something like this. Okay. Where my blocks are moving sideways, and then from that rigid zone up, my blocks are moving just together. Yes? OK. That's what the ice is doing. That ice is moving the greatest distance down here, and it's sort of moving slightly less here, slightly less here, slightly less here, and then these aren't moving at all. OK. But this one is at the base, and so all its movement is just in that layer. If we look at the total amount of movement of this block, it's this amount of movement plus the movement of the block underneath. If we look at this block, the total movement of this block is due to this motion, but also the motion of the block underneath and the block underneath that one. Yes? No? Maybe? Yes? More yeses this time. OK. So that's exactly what our ice is doing. OK? And what we end up with is a shape like this, where we see sort of a, a sort of steep curve here. It sort of shallows out as we get less and less driving stress. And then we get a straight line in that zone of rigid flow. And so the difference between this sort of where this, uh, the basal sliding carried my pipe 
and how much my pipe would have bent at the maximum amount. So this distance here, this is the amount due to internal deformation. OK, so if it was just basal sliding, my pipe would be in a nice straight line just further down. But because there's a certain amount of internal deformation as well, if I went back and looked at my glacier, then I wouldn't just see an up-down pipe. I'd actually see that it was bent at the bottom, and then it was sort of straight again close to the top. And that's basically what that complicated-looking diagram is showing you. But I just think it's nicer if we draw it rather than anything else. Okay? So we've got that rigid zone up at the top, okay, where there isn't enough striving stress for it to internally deform. We've got the plastic zone, the zone of plastic flow underneath, where you can see those ice crystals would be sliding past each other, but they'll slide past each other much more down at the base because we've got all of that overlying weight forcing them to move. Okay, And so the amount of movement just due to the basal sliding is just what you would have between that straight pipe, the original position, and the base of that pipe sort of after a few months or a year or so. The change in the shape of that pipe, the extra distance due to that curve, is what we would have due to internal deformation. Okay, So this sometimes takes a little bit of thinking about. Draw it out yourself, see if you can sort of work out what's going on, um, and speak to the TAs as well, and they would be able to help you with that, because we do need to move on, unfortunately. OK? Um, this can be something for the review on Friday, perhaps. OK. So let's think about crevasses, because crevasses are really cool. And we only tend to get these. You can see that they are drawn in our diagram. We only get these in the rigid zone. Okay? We're going to break something apart. We can't break apart a liquid. So where that ice is behaving plastically, where it's flowing, we can't open up big gaps. But we can open up big gaps. We can break it apart in that rigid zone. And that's what we're doing. Okay? And so these form when the ice breaks as it moves, and they especially form when ice speeds up or if it goes down a really steep slope. And these things are absolutely beautiful. You can see a little person at the bottom of this one for scale. And this is what is likely to kill you if you decide to hike across a glacier, OK? Because um, often these things are covered by snow. And so if you ever see people um, roped together when they go uh, climbing in, in ice, partly it's to stop someone sliding down. But also it's because uh, you never know when you're going to be walking across a sort of thin layer of snow. And underneath, there can be these big crevasses. So they're quite dangerous things. Okay? And you can see them opening up there as the ice flows down. And they tend to open up parallel to the flow. So there's a nice little um, diagram here or animation here. There's also uh, where I got that diagram from here. Okay, So that also has a little animation there, which you may find helpful. But if we just think about crevasses, then our crevasses tend to form where we're stretching our ice. And when we stretch that ice in that rigid zone, it sort of comes apart. So you can see that as we go around that bend, where that ice is being sort of pulled apart in, in sort of places, we open up crevasses. Also, when we go down some sort of really steep area, we tend to get crevasses. And for those of you on the Facebook group, I posted those the links to the Glacier Works website where they do these overflights of the glaciers around Everest. And you can see that. You can see nice, smooth areas. And then when it goes down a really steep incline, you can see all these crevasses opening up. And then when you get down to the sort of lower levels again, when the ice gets compressed, when it slows down again, you can see that those crevasses then close up again. Okay? So crevasses are just a way of accommodating that flow in the rigid zone at the top. Okay. So how do we go about measuring glacier flow? So we've already seen that measuring glacier mass balance is relatively difficult. Measuring glacier flow is also pretty difficult. It's one of the reasons that these are introducing big uncertainties into, say, our future uh, climate models. And so what we can do is at least measure the, the speed and the velocity of the surface. 
So remember, speed is just how quickly you're moving. Velocity is that plus in a certain direction. Okay, so don't get too confused with the terminology. And so what we can do is we could just stick a big stake in the surface and then come back in a certain amount of time and see how far it's moved. We can get slightly more high tech by, uh, from that by using GPS paired with that. And that gives us sort of a, a longer time span. Um, using repeat aerial photography, there are certain features on your glacier on the surface. And if you come back sort of a month later, two months later, if you can track those features, then you should be able to work out uh, how fast your surface glacier is moving at least. Um, and then if we want to know the velocity all the way to the very base, then we have to do that sort of thing where we drill a hole and put a pipe down and see how tilted that pipe is uh, as we come back to it. Okay? Um, and so you can see that our satellite imagery at least produces really beautiful diagrams like that that show you how fast certain parts of the ice are moving. And it's definitely not all moving at the same rate. They're all moving at slightly different uh, rates. And in particular, uh, some researchers in our department are really at the forefront of this, and they produced this really beautiful map last year for the first time showing how fast uh, most of the ice on Antarctica is going. Okay? And you can see that the reddish colors, uh, the, sort of the, the reds and the yellows and the greens, are pretty slow. They're sort of 1.5 to 10 meters per year, which is not far. For those of you that don't know what a meter is, a meter is a pretty giant stride. Okay, so one, two, three meters. But then you can see that there are certain areas where that ice is going really, really, really fast. Okay, up to maybe sort of over a, a kilometer a year in some places, a thousand meters per year. Um, but there do seem to be certain patterns. So, how fast does a glacier actually go? So, to think about this, we need to think about the controls on it. So, if you were to be racing your friend in a kayak down this river, where would you go if you wanted to be fastest? Would you be close to the edges, in the middle, or are both of them about the same? So if you wanted to go fastest and beat your friend, where would you go? OK, any more votes? Right, let's take a look and see who would win. 78% of people would win. You can't have that many people winning. But still, they would be the fastest. OK? Those people that chose to go near the edges, I'm afraid you would definitely lose. Because we tend to be fastest in the middle. Why are we fastest in the middle? There's no rocks. So there's less friction. I had two perfect answers at the front here. OK, so there's less rocks, there's, so there's less friction. OK, so if you imagine that as that water moves, as it goes past something like the rock, something like the base, then it experiences friction. So the place where you're going to get the least friction is when you're furthest away from the sides and from the bottom. And that's the pattern that we see in glaciers as well. Glaciers are just like rivers but they're of ice rather than of water, or of liquid water anyway. And so if we were to think about how fast the ice is flowing, then if we were to look down on the glacier from above, you can imagine just like we said that that water would be going fastest in the middle, the ice is also going fastest in the middle. And as it gets closer to the edges, as it gets closer to the rock walls either side, it experiences more friction, and so it slows down. So that's what the, sort of the, the top diagram shows. And then again, within the ice, we've already talked about this, the fact that there is friction at the base, but that's also where the most driving stress is. Okay? And so we see this pattern of increasing speed away from the base because that motion, remember, is cumulative. So by the time we get halfway up, that ice isn't just feeling its own movement. It's feeling the movement of that layer plus the layer below, plus the layer below that, plus the layer below that. So again, it seems like it's moving slowest at the base, fastest in the middle. And then we've got that rigid zone above. OK? So is everyone confident about that? Yeah? Good. 
And so here's an actual sort of uh, cross-section through the Athabasca Glacier. And you can see that that's exactly what's happening. We see it gets really slow towards the edges. This is of 10 meters per year. And then that fastest zone is really that central area where it's moving as a solid block. And that's going maybe at 50 meters per year. So glaciers can really vary how quickly they move sort of night, day, <laughs> even, um, and over a few days, over a season, over much longer. And so, uh, but they tend to, to sort of follow a certain pattern. So those uh, glaciers that have basal sliding tend to move fastest. The ones that rely on internal deformation move slowest. And um, the fastest ever flow was uh, 113 meters a day. That's really very fast for ice, at least. So you can pace out outside 130 meters, and that's how far the ice would have moved in one day. And you probably could have seen that at that sort of rate. You would have been able to see it, which is very cool. OK. So let's think a bit more about basal sliding, because really, if we're thinking about the really fast moving glaciers, then that's how they're moving. So let's have another think about those different factors that allowed our glacier to slide, specifically things like the surface roughness of the bed, um, so basically how uneven it is, um, what it's made of, whether it's made of sediments or hard rock, and then also about water. So first of all, the bed softness. Okay? So if you're going to have a glacier flowing across a hard rock bed, that's going to sort of give, or give a lot of friction. It's going to offer a lot of resistance. If you're having your glacier that tries to flow across soft sediments, then those soft sediments are also going to sort of respond a little bit and deform a little bit as the ice flows over the top. And so it's going to be easier to slide it across than it would be on solid rock. And then if we get onto our ice shelf, which is above water, water really offers hardly any resistance to that flow. Okay? And so there you would see really, really fast flow rates because there's very little friction underneath. And you can see that this also has a funny effect on our thickness. Because if our glacier is moving really slowly, then it can build up quite a thickness. But then if we suddenly have part of that ice flowing into an area where it can move faster, we're not adding in the same amount that we sort of, uh, we sort of end up spreading out our glacier. Okay? If you end up sort of pulling it faster along, it will sort of spread out. And so you can see that above a rough bed or above a, uh, a sort of a hard rock surface, our ice will be pretty thick. If we go above our soft bed, then that ice will speed up and so it will get a bit thinner. And then our ice shelf itself is really soft and so it will move really fast and that will get even thinner again. And so let's think about that. Let's look back at our diagram of Antarctica. Where are the fastest rates of movement? The ice shelves, absolutely. So you can see those big purple and sort of pinky areas there. Those, if you compare back, those are where our ice shelves are. Okay? So it does make sense. This isn't all theory and, and nonsense. If we look at our maps, this is what we see, that our greatest movement is there where there's less resistance. So bed roughness. So this is basically saying how uneven our surface is. And uh, we have to think about this. So how does sli ice slide over bumps? Okay? And it's to do with that pressure melting again. Do you remember, as we add pressure, that sort of the melting point of ice gets lower. And so if you imagine my ice in this diagram flowing sort of down that slope, when it hits that bump, we're going to have more resistance. And so that ice sort of piling in behind is going to put more and more pressure on the ice immediately before the bump. And that extra pressure means that it's going to be easier for it to melt. Okay? And so we have pressure melting. That increased pressure of the ice behind as it sort of runs against this bump melts that ice. And that means that, first of all, there's more water, which makes it easier to slide, but also that is now sort of that water can flow around rather than the ice having to sort of go across it. Okay? But you can see that as soon as that water flows over the top and ends up on the other side, then all of a sudden we don't have that same pressure again. It's not blocked anymore. We don't have that pressure from behind. And so now we've sort of decreased pressure again. And so what are we going to do? 
it going to stay liquid? No, it's going to refreeze. Because the only reason it was liquid before is because we put that extra pressure on it. If we then take that pressure away, it's going to refreeze. Okay? So this is how we can slide ice past nice big bumps in our surface, is because we can have pressure melting upstream, and then that refreezes downstream of our bump. Okay? So lastly, let's think about water, because water is really the most important thing. Slip and slides, it could be rough or sort of smooth or soft or, or hard, but if you're not going to have water, you're not really going to get sliding. So, first of all, how do we get water? You've seen this so many times now. Pressure melting, we've just talked about that. But also, do you remember, we saw that when we have ablation, when we have surface melting, then that water didn't just sit on the ice and then refreeze in the winter. It usually found ways to tunnel down right to the base of the ice. Okay? Um, and so you can see that we can have that water and it can travel all the way down. So the questions that we then have is, how might that amount of water change through time and how might that affect our glacier speed? But also, how is that water distributed? Okay, Because we're not going to necessarily have the same amount of water everywhere. So first of all, it's a complicated looking diagram, but the bottom part of this shows discharge, which is basically how much water is coming out at the bottom of that glacier. Above that, you can see velocity, and you can see that in the dotted line, we have basal sliding. Okay? And then you can see that our creep, which is that internal deformation, is at the top, and you can see it's much less. And so the sum of those is that solid line in between those two. Okay? So looking at that velocity, and this goes to the, the lines of the page mark Jan, uh, June and July, okay, and then December, January. So looking at that graph, when is the glacier moving more quickly? When are the peaks in velocity? So this is June, July, December, January, June, July, December, January, June. Any more votes? Right, let's take a look. See if we agree. Summer. Yeah, most of us agree that it's the summer. Um, but I can see why you were saying spring for some of you. So if you look, if we follow this sort of velocity, you can see that here is higher, here is lower. If we follow that, then it's pretty low around November, December, January, February. Then it starts to speed up again around April, May, and then it hits its peak around June, July. Okay? So that's when it would be moving most quickly. So... Why is it moving most quickly? Well, you can look at that graph and you can look at the amount of water coming out from the glacier and you can say, well, they sort of match up, don't they? And that's pretty unsurprising because in summer we're going to be having more melt, we're going to be having more water getting down to the base of that ice. And so unsurprisingly, it gets faster. So in our early winter, we have pretty low melt water, we have pretty low pressure, and so there isn't really very much sliding going on. Okay? You can also see that as that ice gets colder, it's more difficult for it to deform, and so even that internal deformation slows down a bit. In the late win winter, we start to get sort of a little bit more melt water, and so it speeds up a little bit. In spring, we see even more melt water. And then in the early summer, we see a lot of water under the ice. We're sort of getting lots of melt. And so that's when we're going to have our maximum sliding. Okay? Because even though we have more water after that, look when our peak water is sort of coming out. Our peak water is, is sort of at this point here, which is in July. And after that peak water, our glacier starts slowing down again. Okay? And that's because a lot of that water that was under the ice and allowing it to slide along has now flowed away. And so it's not really helping us out anymore. 
So that glacier really follows that. This, you can see how closely the speed of that glacier follows the amount of water that's there. But our water isn't distributed evenly. So here's just a little uh, uh, sort of image showing how uneven that water can be. So we have little lakes forming, and then that lake water can flow down moorlands and end up um, either in fractures in the ice, or it can make it all the way down to the bottom. And then that sort of water at the base can either be sort of spread out, or it can form little tunnels and travel through the ice. So it's a really complicated system. And this is one of the reasons it's so difficult to model it using computers, because the movement of that ice really depends on where that water is. And it's a pretty chaotic system. It's not necessarily easy to do, um, and it's sort of small scale changes. So here's a question for you. Can water ever flow uphill? OK. Let's take a look and see what people think. So 60-40. 60 percent of people say yes. 40 say no. One person doesn't know. And so. <laughs> So someone who said yes, why can it flow uphill? What important piece of machinery that you operate relies on this? Have you ever heard of hydraulics? <laughs> yeah. So the key behind this idea is water is incompressible, right? So if I had sort of a, a box, I could keep forcing air in. Okay. If I have a box and I try and put water in it, and it gets full, and I try and put more water in it, it doesn't work, right? It overflows. It's incompressible. We can't squeeze it together anymore. And so what happens if I have my box of water that's nice and full, and I press down on it? It goes out the sides, right? So the key to this idea is that we have to think about the overlying pressure. So if we think about our sort of big ice sheet up here, and here's our sort of ground surface, OK? Here's my ice again. So my ice surface is a little bit uneven. And here is my layer of water down here, OK? Oh, hang on. Scrap that. Sorry about that. So here is my surface, OK? Here is my ice. And so if I have a thin layer of water down here, then am I going to be able to get it to go up here? And the answer is yes, it can flow uphill because if we think about the pressure that that layer of water is feeling because of that overlying ice, if we think about what it would feel up here, it's going to be less pressure. And so from here, where it's feeling a lot of pressure from that overlying thicker ice, it is going to be forced up here to where there's less thickness and so less pressure. Okay? So just like if you had a big sort of box full of water and you press down on one side, it would go up on the other side, okay? because there's less pressure on that side. And ice works the same way. So under ice, if there's enough pressure, then actually you can get water flowing ever so slightly uphill. And we also need to think about whether that water is a nice solid layer along the base. And it actually isn't always that way. So we talk about distributed systems where water is much more spread out evenly across the whole base of that ice. Or we can have something more like channels. In which of these cases do you think my glacier will flow more quickly? If you were going down a slip and slide, would you want a nice even distribution of water or water just in the middle? No one knows? We should go try it. Um, <laughs> you would probably, well, I would want anyway. I would want a pretty even distribution of water, OK? Because we, we don't necessarily, definitely the ice perhaps over that particular channel might be able to move fast. But really what we're interested in is in moving the whole glacier. And to do that, we need to be able to lift the whole thing. And so we want that water to be more distributed. And so where we tend to get channels is over really solid rock, OK? And when there's a lot of water around, that's when we tend to get channels, especially in the summer. 
Where we have more distributed system is when our bed surface is more uneven, it allows that water to collect in different pockets. Um, and also where we have sort of slightly softer sediment. Okay. So that sort of pattern will also affect how our glacier moves. And we'll have a look, an example on Friday, how our glacier can surge because of this change in whether the water is distributed or channelized, which is fun. Okay. So as a quick example, this sort of thing is happening on Greenland already. We can see that where we have that ice moving down to the, the bottom of the ice sheet. Okay. So here's our little glacier uh, and our lake on our surface. And when that lake drains down, that water can travel along the base of the ice and it sort of allows it to slide more. And it's not just that period that, or that part of the ice that's sliding. You can see that that means that now the rest of it, that ice behind it, can also start moving faster. And that's what we're seeing on Greenland today. Okay? Our other example is looking at Antarctica. Because you would think that Antarctica is so cold that it wouldn't really have water underneath. But remember, those ice sheets are really thick, and so there's a huge amount of pressure at the base. And also, we just have heat escaping from those rocks all the time. And so actually, underneath Antarctica, we have this amazing network of rivers and streams and also lakes. Who's heard of Lake Vostok? Nobody? Oh, OK. But Lake Vostok has been isolated. It's been isolated from the rest of the world for 800,000 years. And so they've been drilling into it to see if we can find unique sort of life that, wasn't, or that hasn't been exchanging. A gene Stop packing up. I still have two minutes, honestly. OK. So Lake Vostok is cool, so listen, because um, we want to sort of study whether life can exist in this really extreme uh, ecosystem, because if we're going to look for life on other planets as well, like on Europa, which is this frozen uh, moon of Jupiter, then that will give us a sense of whether that's possible for life. And so how have they adapted to that really cold, dark conditions that are so completely different from anything to do with photosynthesis? Um, so it's really an interesting place, but it's a real technological challenge because how do you drill down into it without polluting that lake, without introducing life that's on the surface today? So it's a really interesting place. And just as a last quick example, here's our bird glacier. And this is taken from Helen Fricker, who's a really cool glaciologist down at San Diego. Um, and she studied bird glacier, and she saw that the ice suddenly sped up really quickly one year. And it happened to be because there was, underneath Bird Glacier, one of these subglacial lakes. And all of a sudden, water built, built up in those lakes, and it was able to drain down. As the, and as that water drained down, that whole ice suddenly sped up really fast. Okay? And this was sort of the first time we really got a clear idea that there's this huge link between water and ice. Okay, now you can go. I'll see you on Friday.